Um, so welcome, I'm Lisa Ryman. I am the president of Preservation Burlington. Now you can't hear me at all. Pay no attention to the man behind the curtain. <laughs> Um, and um, we're really excited to have you here this evening. Um, first, I just wanna thank Main Street Landing for being our program sponsor and providing this beautiful space for us. So I'd like to, first of all, just give a shout out to our board. We are a nonprofit volunteer run board and we do this because we just love history and Burlington and mostly each other. Um, this is, we this year we did actually, we splurged a little bit and we went and had a photo shoot. So um, this is us. And I just want everybody who's here to stand and just take a little bow. So Matt Bienz, Devin Coleman, Ryan Heron, Sadie Block, um, Bob Davino, Ron Wanamaker, Jack Mentes. Is Pauline here yet? Mo momentarily. Um, so thank you all so much for all your passion and work. Not with us tonight are Marge um, and I think, and Krista, so. Um, you will meet them at different opportunities. So we're just gonna begin and sort of recap our year. It's been a really busy year. There have been some highs and lows. Um, the highs, we sold out our homes tour again for the second year in a row. I think we had 600 officially sick tickets sold, but I think we probably had closer to 700 people coming through the homes. We had really successful walking tours at Art Hop and the Ramble, the ONE Ramble. Um, our Historic House Marker, Marker Program has kind of exploded. <laughs> um, I think I've done six in the past few months and Marge, who is not here, has been scrambling to get um, a lot more done. And some of the stories that are coming out are really fascinating. I think just this month alone, I found out about Charles Boynton, who used to work for the Wells Richardson Company. He was a pharmacist and consulting physician. And unfortunately, he met his demise right after he talked to his secretary, turned around and stepped into the elevator shaft and poof, um, crushed his skull. So um, that was sad. <laughs> Um, <laughs> uh, then there was another story of um, a neighborhood grocer um, who, for some reason, there was um, the, the, the old Burlington Free Press and all the newspapers are phenomenal. And they, they documented everything, right? Like who went out of town, where, who they met, who they cavorted with, all the scandals. And this one was um, a father had been sued by his son for beating him basically. And it was all documented in the newspaper. So all these stories that are coming to light when people ask us to research the history of their houses. So it's really, really fun for me to do that. We've had historic cemetery tours. Um, Jason Stuffel here, has, raise your hand, take a bow um, from the um, Old East End group and Greenmount Cemetery sharing passion and knowledge. Um, we've had some website and tech updates. We are now in the 21st century in terms of email. So we'll be sending pretty emails more often. Um, so get ready for that. Um, and we had a work study student for the very first time this year and a summer intern. So that's been really exciting. Speaking of our summer intern, we had um, uh, Isabel Vivanco from Smith College. Um, also, you may recognize the Vivanco name. Um, uh, and she studied the evolution of Burlington's park system and how that played into the history of Burlington. And she created a really amazing place-based curriculum um, educational toolkit around her findings. So that's something that we're really excited to start being able to share with schools and school districts. Um, advocacy, there's been, this is kind of the one that's been up and down and highs and lows. Um, we are um, continuing our efforts to prevent the demolition of the former 
Cathedral of Immaculate Conception and um, the landscape designed by Dan Kiley. Um, the property was pro profiled by the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Preservation Magazine. We've had lots of prominent preservationists and preservation groups rally to support this important building. Um, where that stands right now is we were at the Mont Vermont Supreme Court um, in September, and we are waiting for a final decision on that. Um, there's a little bit more complicated stuff going on with um, the church parish current situation. So that one's still in limbo. But we also have on our watch list, the Memorial Block, um, a really key group of properties in Burlington that include Memorial Auditorium, Central Fire Station, and the old YMCA building. Um, we have been meeting with city representatives, with the development team, um, and we continue to advocate for the preservation and adaptive reuse of all these historic landmarks. So more to come on that. We also have PBTV, <laughs> and for the first time today, I got told, hey, I recognize you from TV. <laughs> That's the first time anybody's ever said that to me, and it was really exciting because nobody watches this program. Um, <laughs> one person, one person does now. So Greg, thank you very much. I didn't pay him. Um, but we really love this show. It's, you know, 30 minutes once a month, and we're always looking for guests and stories. So if you know somebody who has a really great story to tell, is passionate about Burlington history or the craft that they do or anything related to preservation, let us know. We'd love to have them on. Right, Ron? Yes. And we want to shout out um, one of our people, Pauline Kehoe. She's not here yet. Damn it. <laughs> I said I wouldn't swear. Sorry. Um, Pauline has been our administrative assistant for several years, and she's been really instrumental in keeping us on track, holding us accountable, making sure we do the things we say we're going to do, helping stuff envelopes and newsletters and following up on tasks, um, keeping our donor database up and running and current. And she has decided to step away um, to focus on other things. And we really wanted to thank her for her service. Um, and so we're just going to yell surprise when she comes in the room, okay? <laughs> so thank you for Pauline. I'm gonna have you clap when she actually comes in the room and we'll just backtrack a few slides. We also wanted to um, pa uh, note some important friends that we've lost in the past year. Um, Sylvia Holden, Bill Mars, and Sarah Dopp. They have been stalwarts in the preservation community. They have been really good friends to Preservation Burlington. And um, we wouldn't be, I think, the organization that we are if not for them as well. So um, we remember them fondly and we are very sad to have seen them go. All right, from sadness to excitement the Preservation Awards. So every year we do this, we look for properties that meet certain requirements that really exemplify um, good stewardship and good care of historic buildings in five categories, the residential, commercial, institutional, spirit of preservation, and the Ray O'Connor Community Improvement Awards. I think residential, commercial, institutional are pretty self-explanatory. The spirit of preservation is really for a property that has just been lovingly maintained. One of the basic definitions of preservation is do nothing, just maintain. And so we've always wanted to recognize people who just love their homes and take care of them and don't do anything crazy to them. Um, so there's that. So the first one we're going to award tonight is a residential award. And who's speaking on this one? Karen? <laughs> um, yeah, this is a um, residential award. It's a very exciting um, project and something for me to, uh, to introduce. Um, it's one of our, my wife and my favorite buildings in Burlington. And we were, we just watched it over the years. It was a multifamily 
building, um, not well maintained, and it caught on fire. It's uh, 175, 177 South Union Street, the John Sachs House, um, built in 1845 with alterations in 1870, sort of bringing it into the Greek revival style. <clears throat> um, after the fire, there was substantial damage. Um, and uh, well, Sarah and Najama Brash bought the house and instead of, despite everyone telling them they should just knock it down and start over again, uh, they put in all the effort to restore the property back to essentially better than it was, like the million dollar man. Uh, um, I, I believe the entire interior had to be structurally reconfigured. Um, it's a bearing wall brick structure, so a lot of that stayed. Um, they maintained the historic windows and most fenestration in the back of the house that had been sort of added on to where the fire began was um, reimagined. And um, it's just an amazing house. And it was on the Homes Tour this year. So if any of you had made the Homes Tour, you've seen it inside and out. Um, it's just really, really spectacular project. Um, and I know part of, make, part of doing a project like this and saving a house um, is the right people and the right team. And the owners worked with Brian Carpenter as the contractor on site, and he brought in and found a lot of great people to work with, recreating moldings. Um, Jay Mechanical helping um, completely modernize the, in, infra, the HVAC and the, the mechanical infrastructure of the building and then make it invisible. Um, and Vivian, uh, GVV Architects. I don't know if Anne's here tonight. She's a, a big supporter, past president of Preservation Burlington, um, and she was the architect on the project and worked with uh, Jama and uh, Sarah. Um, and then uh, my shop got to do a little bit of work. Sam Barnhart, that uh, was working out of my shop, um, did some restoration on windows and doors and, and recreated a door. It was just a really super fun project with a lot of amazing details. Um, and our favorite favorite house is still in Burlington. Thank you both. Um, thanks. Come on up and get to the Okay, next up is a commercial award. And who is speaking on this? It's you, right? Come on up. Good evening, I'm Devin Coleman, a member of the Preservation Burlington Board. And we are uh, recognizing uh, 326 College Street, also known as the uh, Harrington Apartments, uh, for work they did in the last few years on the monumental portico. Uh, this building was built in 1830 for Dr. John Peck, who was a successful doctor in town, but also uh, entered into the dry goods and wholesale business and did very well and was able to build this grand <laughs> mansion for himself on the uh, hillsides of Burlington overlooking the lake. And it features uh, most prominently in its federal Greek revival style, uh, this monumental portico, two-story tall uh, Roman Doric columns that are uh, kind of landmarks if you drive up or down College Street, they're, they're just right there. <laughs> so uh, it really would have been a loss to lose this architectural feature of this, uh, this property. So the West Portico, which we see here uh, in the process of restoration, and if you look carefully, you'll note there's, there's nothing under those columns. <laughs> they're, they're supported, <laughs> but this project was to build new bases to help ventilate the shaft, the inner shaft of the column, to help keep them intact and build a new roof over the porch and really uh, give everything a good coat of paint. And it looks, uh, you know, as good or better today than it did when it was built almost 200 years ago. The Harrington Apartment Complex provides 16 apartments um, of rental housing in downtown Burlington and is owned by Janif Holdings, and uh, which is run by the Farrell family, which has owned it since 1957. So long-term commitment to this property, which we really appreciate. And we want to recognize Janif Holdings uh, for their time, effort, and expense put into this project, which is definitely helping to keep the quality of life and the quality of, of Burlington's architecture intact. So uh, representatives from Janif like to come up. Oh, 
Okay. So next we couldn't decide what we wanted to do. So we went with multiple properties. Mm. Might have these mislabeled, but anyway. Institutional award, we have um, Karen to present. Good evening, everyone. I'm Karen Nord, also a board member of Preservation Burlington. Um, we are delighted to recognize the city of Burlington's restoration work on Redstone Cottage and also the Sexton's House, which you're going to see on a second slide after this. Um, in particular, we're going to be recognizing quite a few folks, um, particularly Parks and Recreation Department Director Cindy White. And I apologize if I mispronounce any of your names. Um, <laughs> uh, Jay White Architect, uh, Eric Guilefield of Farrington Construction, Sean Chevalier Mason um, for work on both of those projects. Uh, also for the Sexton's House, Kim Bleakley, uh, Burlington Central Facilities Manager, and Tina Lessam, Burlington Capital Projects Coordinator. God, it looks so much better, so much better. I just, when I saw the Sexton's house and the work that was done, I was just blown away. It really is just a striking contrast. Um, first, I'm gonna talk about Redstone Cottage. So I'm gonna go back to that. Uh, Redstone Cottage was built in 1906 for Dr. Walter Berry. Um, this property had some deterioration by the time the city had purchased the property in 2015 from the Catholic diocese. Um, but a lot of the original interior features and exterior features were intact, which is wonderful. Um, the city has decided to have the surrounding acres and the building itself be kind of like a park space, a place for the citizens. Um, I'm actually going to quote here from a text given to me by Jay White, um, which succinctly describes the work done. So start quote, the intent was to preserve the property for conservation and provide direct natural access from North Ave to Lake Champlain and the Burlington Greenway bike path through a new public park. Oh, I'm going to butcher this last, this name, Keys, Keys Leach? Keys Lick. I did butcher it. Keys <laughs> Park. Um, Redstone Cottage properly rehabilitated to this new use while restoring all of its historic features um, shows how excellent preservation work can meet modern functional needs and marry building conservation with natural conservation. So if you haven't been out here, I really recommend to go out and see the cottage and the surrounding garden and the park. It's just really well done. It's beautiful. Um, open in 2024, the building now includes headquarters for the Burlington Parks, Recreation Waterfront, Conservation Staff, a public restroom that can be used after hours, a public research area in the dining room of the cottage, and a public meeting space in the West Wing for 30 people with a kitchenette and another accessible restroom and high tech hybrid meeting connections and screen. Really just like a magnificent project. Um, the design restores all of the exterior and first floor of the cottage as it was in 1906, except for the bathroom to make it fully accessible. The second floor of the cottage was also restored, but with a new stairway to meet code requirements. Um, and yet be open, airy, and inviting at the same location as the original stairway, which had been closed off. Um, the new office space on the second floor is open and flexible with access to a restored exterior balcony. Um, end quote. There is additional work being done on, there is also a lot of additional work done on this property. Um, it's really just an excellent example of rehabilitation of a property and also to meet a new modern use. Um, in addition, I'm going to go over to the second property. Um, we would also like to recognize the exterior work that was done in 2024 to the Sexton's house in Lakeview Cemetery. Trivia question. Anyone know what the Sexton did? Yeah, grave digger also kind of like managed the church and the graveyard property. Well done, well done. Um, <laughs> uh, this is a Gothic revival cottage. Um, and as you can see in this photo, uh, it had an enclosed porch um, and they have restored the form, the original porch, how it would have looked uh, when this cottage was first built. Um, new paint was done. The window surrounds and verge boards were also redone. Um, I personally was just absolutely so impressed by this preservation project. Um, it's clearly significantly improved um, and just a delight to go by. 
Um, so if I could have representatives who are here today come up and accept this award now, um, that would be lovely. Uh, please join me in giving me a round of applause for those involved for this project. I was confused earlier because apparently we messed up. I messed up. I put residential on this slide instead of institutional. So that's why. Um, but this was an institutional award. Okay, we have one more institutional award um, to give because there were just so many this year. And Devin is going to come up and tell us about it. Hello again. Happy to uh, present an award for McDonald Hall at Champlain College, uh, one of their landmark, many landmark buildings that comprise the Champlain College campus. This one on South Willard Street and really one of the you know, corner anchors of that neighborhood, uh, really a, a focal point if you ever drive through and around the campus through the hill section, this building stands out as being um, really special. It was built uh, in 1897, designed by Burlington architect W.R.B. Wilcox, who's known for a number of, of large, grand estate houses in the Hill section. Uh, it was acquired by Champlain College in 1979 and uh, used as a dormitory. And, you know, dormitories take a beating. <laughs> it's, it's a hard life. Um, and after, after several decades, it was time for a refresh. And this was really, uh, this was a major project that they did in eight months because they had to fit it, you know, within the academic calendar. And, you know, these are dorm rooms, students need to live somewhere. So they, they packed a lot of punch into a very short time frame and uh, did beautiful restoration work on the exterior, um, did a lot of great work on the interior, uh, preserving and restoring a lot of historic uh, woodwork and decorative features that are still intact on the inside. Uh, despite having been transformed into a dormitory in the late 70s, um, there is still a lot of historic integrity inside. So it was nice that that was recognized and celebrated and it's a great place for students to live. Uh, I think most interestingly is that this is a great project that shows how historic preservation and sustainability are not mutually exclusive. They can exist together. This building is 100% fossil free, fossil fuel free. Um, so a lot of effort went into making this accessible, comfortable, suitable for student life in the 21st century, uh, but retaining the qualities of the building that that are what we love about it. It's historic aspects and character and features. It houses uh, 45 students today and they're lucky. I'd, I'd love to live in this dorm. <laughs> so could we have some representatives from Champlain College please come up and accept your award. Okay, we have one more award this evening, the Ray O'Connor Community Improvement Award. Who is presenting that? Come on up, Bob. Hello, I'm Bob Devineau. I'm a member of the board and I've been pleased to be the uh, chair of the Education Committee this year. And we've done a number of uh, interesting programs touring cemeteries, walking tours, and other programs. One of the people I've been very pleased to work with over the past year is Diana Carlisle. The Ray O'Connor Award is in recognition of individuals whose work has made a significant contribution to the quality of life in Burlington. And uh, Diana has done that in spades. Um, Diana attended Middlebury College where she earned a BA in American History she earned an MA in education at Fairfield University, and she's brought her loves of education and history uh, to full growth here in Burlington. In 1993, Diana began researching the history of Burlington Glass Company, 
It was one of the very first industrial um, institutions here in Burlington, founded in 1827. Her research became a scholarly article published in Vermont History in 2000. In the summer of two, uh, 2024, Diana coordinated um, the placement of a roadside historic plaque in Battery Park, commemorating the history of Burlington Glass Company. She's also been actively involved with the Friends of Lakeview Cemetery for many years and has overseen the restoration of the Louisa Howard's Chapel, the repair of the Historic Cemetery Foundation, historically accurate creation of the gazebo out there, and in fall of 2024, um, saw come, come, coming to fruition was the installation of new lighting for the chapel. If you get a chance to go out and see the Sexton's house at Lakeside Cemetery, also um, Lakeview Cemetery, excuse me. Also, if you get a chance, go in and look at the chapel. It's a magnificent space. It's a space that's uh, available for weddings and other events. It's just a wonderful part of our history. And uh, Diana has been a pleasure to work with. She's always willing to help us out. And uh, we're more than happy to give the Ray O'Connor Award to Diana. I think the honor is ours. And if you couldn't tell which one she is in the big picture, there's a nice little red circle <laughs> for you. You were there. The photographs were taken by Ron Wanamaker from our board, and it's the uh, event that was a beautiful uh, Sunday and as you can see, a group of people who were family members from some of the early uh, glassmakers uh, came back to town. They had the commemoration of the plaque. Um, it was just a wonderful event, which unfortunately I wasn't able to attend, but uh, we are very happy that we were able to take part in it. Okay, we have our tardy guest in the room now. So on three, you're all gonna yell surprise, right? One, two, whoops, three. <laughs> surprise! So Colleen, we just wanted to honor you for keeping us accountable, on track, on target. Um, and we have something for you that we'll give to you in a little bit. So thank you. And that, um, actually, no, I did make another mistake, um, and I own my mistakes, but all board members, could you stand again? I missed one because she joined us after this picture was taken. So anybody that's on the board, stand up. <laughs> and Marianne, please stand up as well. I'm sorry, I forgot you. <laughs> we are so fortunate to have all these wonderful people doing all this amazing work. Okay, embarrassing moments over. Um, that concludes the award
portion of this evening. Um, but I just want to say we are always looking for interested, passionate people, whether it's for our board. Um, we meet once a month on the second Tuesday of every month, but also for our committees. We have an ed education committee. Bob could surely use some help um, organizing tours and workshops and things. Um, we have an advocacy committee. We have a communications committee, and so many more. And we would really love um, some new faces and new passion to join us. So if that's anything of interest, talk to one of us, visit preservationburlington.org or email us. Um, and we also always would love a little more money in our coffers um, so that we can do the work that we do and protect the buildings that we um, protect. Um, and uh, you can, we, you know, this is part of the high tech thing. You can point your phone at this QR code and make a donation online. So you can take a picture of it now or for later. And again, thank you to um, Chris and Emily for the fabulous food and Main Street Landing for um, helping us put this evening on. Now we're going to switch computers and get you to, no? Yep, yeah, um, get you to the main event. All right, so our speaker for this evening uh, is somebody, if, if you're on Facebook and you follow Burlington Area History Facebook group, you know the work of this man, Bob Blanchard. Um, he is, uh, I'm con constantly amazed at the information, the photos, uh, the documentation that he pulls up from his research. Um, Bob was born and raised in the south end of Burlington and educated in the Catholic school system here in town went to UVM and graduated with a degree in history. So he has training and a background, uh, but then spent 35 years working for the US Customs Service. Um, and in his retirement, took up local history as a quote, serious hobby, which is a serious understatement. <laughs> um, it's just, it's <laughs> remarkable. Um, this is far more than a hobby. Um, and Bob, uh, somewhat surprisingly, lives in St. Albans now, um, but uh, has published a really great book last year on lost Burlington, Vermont, which looks at uh, many of the uh, landmark buildings in our city that have been lost throughout the centuries. Um, some intentionally, some accidentally, um, but Bob will be sharing uh, his his knowledge and information about these great resources that unfortunately are no longer with us. So, Bob. Slides. Did you want me to do that? I do, of course. Yeah, yeah. okay. So, maybe. Okay. Yeah, I, I got so much on my mind. Yeah, yeah. yes. Okay. So, as Devin said, I'm Bob Blanchard, and this was my first book. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Um, I've always been interested in the old 
architecture of Burlington, especially what I call the grand homes, the mansions, the estates, and the and the great public buildings. Um, Burlington, for a city its size, has an incredible architectural treasure trove. And much of the public building portion of that trove, unfortunately, has been lost. The private homes are remarkably intact. There have been some losses, but nothing like the, um, the public buildings. And that's really what this deals with, uh, Lost Burlington. It's, it's the lost public buildings. I call them the landmark buildings. It's not all buildings. There are other things um, that were lost, like giving away all the land that is now South Burlington. Um, uh, <laughs> not the biggest mistake Burlington ever made. Um, so the book is organized by category, churches, hotels, schools. And when I was writing the book and gathering the photos, I noticed an incredible number of these buildings were lost by fire. And as everybody who's lived here any length of time knows, there was a terrible arson epidemic in Burlington in the 1970s. But before that, in the earlier times, there were just tons and tons of accidental fires that consumed huge buildings. And um, so I thought, since this book has been out a year and a half, I thought I'd freshen it up a little bit in this presentation by only talking about buildings that were intentionally taken down by their owners. Mm -hmm. So I'm not going to talk about the fires, basically. Um, before I get going, um, I do have these cards if anybody wants them. Uh, the publisher gave me a whole stack of these, and I forgot to give them out at the other talks I did. Uh, it's basically a miniature version of the book cover. No cost, no obligation. And if you hold on to it for about 100 years, it'll be worth something. <laughs> okay, so we're going to get started here. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, th these are all in the order in which they were lost. So I'm not talking about when this was built. This is the earliest loss of a building. So it's, um, that, that's how we're going to proceed. This is the first Adam School. It was built in uh, around 1872, and same place as the current Adams School. You can see there's two doors. Um, back in those days, the public and the Catholic schools all had separate entrances for the boys and the girls. And you can see in the picture, the boys are on the left, girls are on the right. In the windows and on the lawn, it's kind of a mixture. Um, when this was built, uh, it was built at the same time as the Pomeroy School, and Burlington was experiencing an incredible growth in the school age population. This building was full almost the day it opened, and then it was overcrowded. So it only stood um, about a little, little less than 30 years, and then it was torn down, and then the current Adams School was built, and that's the next slide. That's Adams School right after it opened in 1902. You see, it still has these separate entrances for the boys and the girls. They didn't tear down the Pomeroy School. Uh, they expanded it at the same time that they demolished the first Adams and built the second Adams. Why they decided to demolish this one and expand Pomeroy, I have no idea. Next. Uh, this is the original St. Joseph's Church. It was called St. Joseph's on the Hill. It was at the end of North Winooski Avenue. Back then, Burlington didn't have many trees, and you had a panoramic view from, from uh, that high up. And um, this church, again, Burlington was growing a lot of Catholic immigrants, and so this church became inadequate fairly quickly. I think this was built around 1850. And then the new St. Joseph's opened in the 18, late 1880s, and this became kind of like excess property. They still used it for certain services. They didn't tear it down. And it stood for decades after, after the, the new St. Joseph's opened. Then right around 1900, the diocese decided to put a church at the, uh, on Pine Street, 
uh, intersection of Flint Avenue, St. Anthony's, and they dismantled this building and, go ahead, next, and they erected St. Anthony's using the materials from St. Joseph's on the Hill. Um, so you can see the trolley tracks there and the arms for the trolley wires. So that's what happened to St. Joseph's on the Hill. The next um, is the Burlington Union Station Depot. Burlington was served by, by two railroads, the Rutland Railroad and the Central Vermont, which was originally called the Vermont Central. And in the late 1860s, they built this Union Station for both rail lines. And uh, it was all brick. It was right just about where we're standing right now, very, very close. And it had, it was kind of unique because it had those cupolas on top, which were ventilation shafts. I've never seen smoke coming out of them, but you know, there aren't really that many pictures of this building. And those arches were later replaced by one big opening as the trains got bigger. Um, next, this is the other side of the building that really looked the same on both sides. And the other thing that was interesting about this building is that, um, I think it was the president of one of the railroads insisted that the front entrance faced the lake. So you can kind of see those two flat topped towers. You can just see the top of them. Those framed the front entrance. I've never seen a picture of the front of this building because there's, there's always a steamboat in the way or you know you couldn't really get far enough away because of the water. So in, in, in a sense, it wasn't really a good, a good choice. That was torn down when the new Union Station opened in 1916. Next, we have the Overlake Estate of Colonel Legrand B. Cannon. This was located across from the Burlington Country Club, basically. Colonel Cannon, uh, we can pull up his picture next. He was a very wealthy gentleman, uh, and he made a fortune. He worked uh, as an executive for the Delaware and Hudson Canal Company, which was dug to bring coal from Pennsylvania to the Eastern markets. And he was president of the Champlain Transportation Company for 40 years, which ran steamboats on Lake Champlain. And uh, so he was in Burlington on business for the steamboat company one day, and he was walking around that part of town uh, uh, near where the country club is, and there wasn't anything there at that point. And like I said, there were very few trees. And so he saw this magnificent vista from, you know, as far as the eye could see in both directions, the lake and the mountains, and he was struck by it. So he bought a 60 acre parcel and he built the, the, go ahead. He built this mansion that we just saw and here's another view of it coming up the winding drive to the Port Cochere where the carriages would pick up people. And um, this is the part that faced the lake. Now, this was the Gilded Age, so you need a lot of servants to take care of a place like this, and he had a lot. I did a, uh, I looked at the census records for 1900, and he was an elderly fellow by then, and, um, sorry, I guess I should have had the hand to hand, hand out. Uh, he was the only person living at the house, but he had 17 servants. Um, <laughs> and the interesting thing about the servants, back then you could, they listed the nationalities where everybody was born. The servants were all from Europe. The maids were Irish. The butler was English. The coachman, coachman was English. The cooks were all Scandinavian and so on. The only, he had two Vermonters on the payroll and they were farm laborers. Um, so uh, let's go next. This is actually a member of my group when she was a young girl. She's standing in the tea house on the Overlake estate after it was torn down in 1925, a lot of the outbuildings remained, including this tea house. It's gone now. Next. And this is that same tea house on a postcard. And I included this because you can see the view. That's Shelburne Bay in the distance and the Adirondacks. And, you know, it's just panoramic. So uh, the what happened was, let's go to the next one. Colonel Cannon had four children, only one son. This is him, Henry. Unfortunately, he died when he was 47. So he still had three daughters, but they were all married. Two of them had moved out of the area. Next. The last one, Marie, who stayed in Burlington, 
The colonel, when she got married to a banker from New York named Lewis Clark, he gave them 15 acres of his estate and built this 45 room, 45 room mansion for them. Hmm. So she wasn't interested in living in the old homestead either. So when the colonel died, um, the place was just abandoned basically, it was vacant. I did hear that UVM used it for a women's dorm for a while, but I, I was never able to verify that. But for most of the time, it was empty. And so it just it just deteriorated. And then, uh, go ahead. And, uh, this was um, an ad in a country estate magazine where you could buy country estates um, that were advertised. Grenville Clark is uh, Colonel Cannon's grandson. He was a lawyer in New York City, and he took out this ad trying to sell or lease over Lake, but no takers. Mm. So in 1925, the land was subdivided over Lake Park, was, was uh, created out of the northern portion. I should say where this was. This was between Cliff Street and Ledge Road, and then uh, South Prospect to Willard. So it was a, it wasn't, the, that entire plot, but it was most of it. So it was, it was a very large chunk of land. And so it was very desirable because of all these lake views and it was just a very, very nice piece of property. So Over Lake Park was developed. And of course, the Clark Mansion, the um, one I just showed you, was still there. So um, eventually that fell into um, other hands and it became uh, the Over Lake Day School. And uh, that, that ended up burning, but that's a whole other story. So the, the mansion that uh, the colonel lived in, that was, and by the way, this was just his summer home. He lived in New York City during the winter. Uh, th that was demolished, and uh, there's very few pictures of it. Um, and very, very matter of fact reporting about the fact that it was going to be torn down. There was no, like, oh, isn't this a terrible loss or <clears throat> what an architectural masterpiece? There was none of that. It was just very, very, it's going to be torn down for houses. That was it. Next. And then, you know, this was the coachman's home and the coach barn on the left. And on the right was the gardener's or caretaker's cottage. And these are the only two pieces of it that remain. Um, that coachman's portion was listed for sale for 2.3 million. It's been renovated. I don't know if it's, I don't think it's sold, but um, it's, this is in the extreme northeast corner of the old estate property. It's somewhat visible from the street, especially when uh, the foliage is down. Uh, so that's uh, that's Overlake. This is the old Burlington City Hall, built in 1854. It had a uh, fire company in the basement. You can see on the roof there's a fire bell. This is way before they had fire alarms, and they just rang a bell when there was a fire, and everybody came to the places where the equipment was and went to the fire. You can see it had a, a dome. And interestingly, it faced what was then called Courthouse Square, now City Hall Park. That's, that's the main entrance on the park side. And really there wasn't much of an entrance on the Church Street side um, because Church Street wasn't really where it was at back when this was built. And as time passed and Church Street did become where it was at, the building was somewhat backwards. So when the new city hall was built, they have identical entrances on the front and back. They don't look the same because you know, the stairs are different, but if you look at them closely, the entrances are, are identical. Next, right next door to this was the 1830 courthouse, Chinook County Courthouse. This was um, the third courthouse in Burlington. That's where Courthouse Square got its name. This, the previous two burned. This um, became the Fletcher Free Library when the 1871 courthouse was built further down Church Street. And so, I, I don't know if you can make it, at the bottom it says Fletcher Free Library. And, and in later years, they did say it right on the building. So, time passed, both this courthouse and the old city hall became inadequate. They were both torn down, and the new city hall was built, and that opened around 1929. Next. The other thing that happened in 1929, of course, was the stock market crash. And so um, when you tear a building down, or at least back in, in the day when you did tear a building down, it was normally to put something else up. And all of a sudden, because of the stock market crash, there wasn't a lot of money for building anything. So 
There's not a lot of lost buildings during the 30s. The next one in the book, at least, is this one, which is the Green Mountain Sanitarium. This was built as a residence. It was on the corner of North, North Union and Pearl. As you can see, very magnificent uh, French Second Empire with a beautiful, tall Belvedere with a widow's walk on top. And Henry Hickok, who built this, was a wealthy, he was a congregational minister, and he was also a very wealthy uh, businessman and banker in Burlington. So after he died, it was sold and it, it was converted into a sanitarium. Um, and it remained a sanitarium until next, the first national supermarket chain. This was 1940, 41. Um, the history of supermarkets in Burlington is quite interesting. Chain stores had been in Burlington for decades, uh, but they were they were very small. Uh, first National had six stores in Burlington in the 30s. They were all tiny, about the size of a mom and pop store. Grand Union had five, a and had five or six. They were all, all small. So the national trend was toward supermarkets. So First National was scouting around for a place and they wanted to be as close to Church Street as possible. They tried to get something right next to the Richardson. That didn't work out. So they ended up buying the sanitarium property and they built this supermarket, which opened in 1941. The mansion actually was to the right where the parking lot is. So they actually built the store while the mansion was still standing. Then they knocked it down because they needed the parking. So that was the end of the, that sanitarium. So then in 1941, of course, the United States entered World War II. And so now you had another problem. You couldn't build because there were no materials available because of shortages and priorities. So again, there's a long stretch where nothing gets torn down until the 50s. And once the 50s got going, um, as far as tearing things down, they really got going. Next. There was one exception. There was one exception. That, this is the third yacht club clubhouse of the Lake Champlain Yacht Club. The first two burned. The first one was magnificent. This is right where the boathouse is. They, all three of them are in the same place. The first one was huge and beautiful, and it burned after 13 years. They built a smaller one, which was still quite nice. That burned um, in 1911, that stood 10 years. They built this one, which is the least of the three by far, in my opinion. So what happened after this uh, opened up in 1913, the waterfront was really starting to deteriorate in many, many regards. <clears throat> the prosperous mills and factories that were right on the waterfront, they were belching smoke and trains were running back and forth belching smoke. And there were piles of lumber everywhere, but it was prosperity. And so everybody had no problem with it. They just looked out to the lake. They didn't look <laughs> toward, toward the, uh, the shore much, I guess. So um, once the mills all closed, the, the waterfront just became derelict. Uh, there were piles of debris everywhere. There was a junkyard. The piers were overgrown with trees and weeds. It was awful. And so the yacht club said, we've had enough. They, they moved out. And so this building was empty for some time, but then there was a new ferry company called the Green Mountain Adirondack Ferry, and they were building, they built two modernistic ferry boats. They built them on the Burlington waterfront, and they were gonna set speed records going back and forth across the lake. And so this building became the ferry terminal for that company. It didn't last because the war happened and the boats got interned and then they were sold and so on. So this, this building, just became a vacant eyesore. Now the mayor at the, time, at the time, John J. Burns, had a real passion to clean up the waterfront. There wasn't much money because of the depression and the, and the war and everything. So he put out the word that if you could come down and take this building apart, you could have all the lumber. And so that's what happened. A, a contractor next from the islands came down with his crew. That's how it looked. Before they started, you can see the Streamline Ferry sign is you know, half gone. The ticket booth is looking pretty bad. Next. So th this is them taking it apart. Uh, next. 
And then, you know, most of the building's gone. Next, only the uh, pier is left. And then this is later, this is years later, same spot though, you can see those, those piers, pilings, whatever you want to call them, were, were in, they're in pictures, many, many, many pictures of the Burlington waterfront over the years because they stayed there. They, you know, they didn't bother to pull those up. Um, and like I said, now the, the boathouse is there, so much, much improved. Next. This is the Berean Baptist Church. It was on the corner of North Winooski and Pearl. And it was built in 1880, I believe. Don't hold me to these dates. They're, they're approximate. Uh, the Bereans were an offshoot of the Baptist, and they weren't in this building all that long. The, the group that was in it a long time was the uh, Women's Christian Temperance Organization. Um, they, took, they bought it, and they held regular meetings there. They would have Bible verses above, on the North, uh, North Winooski Avenue side, right above those four windows, they would put Bible verses um, a lot of them having to do with, you know, drinking and so forth. Um, and so th this stayed there for well into the 20th century and was finally sold to the Gulf Oil Company in 1952. They knocked it down. They put, uh, put up a gas station, um, which is, that's gone too. Um, so that's what happened to the Berean Baptist Church. Now, next. Okay, this is actually a residence in... Uh, very historic residence and a very beautiful old Victorian. This was 83 Pine Street. This was historic because it was one of the homes of W.J. Van Patten, who was not only the mayor of Burlington, he also founded the Maltex Company, and he was one of the founders of the Wells Richardson Company, which are two of the very few Burlington companies that went national. So um, he's a really important figure in Burlington history. So this was built in, in the 1880s, 85. I'm not, I'm not going to hold myself to that. But anyway, um, so what happened was C.P. Smith, who had a Ford dealership at 87 St. Paul Street for decades, the car culture was starting to really explode and everybody was getting cars and, and um, the, the dealers needed room. So some of them moved out to Wilson Road and uh, <clears throat> some just bought more property. So C.P. Smith bought this house and the land it sat on and leveled it and put a huge car lot in there. Um, and you can see in the next slide, next picture, uh, this is, uh, the, see the, the fence? That's where the, the house you just saw was, and there's a couple of cars in there. Um, now, this house would have been leveled anyway, even if C.P. Smith had never been born because it was in the urban renewal zone. So that house to the right, urban renewal level. So, um, but anyway, I just thought it was kind of interesting because I had never seen that building, um, that mansion, until literally a couple months ago. Uh, all right, uh, next. This is the Lawrence Barn School, built in 1898 on the corner of North Street and Murray. You can see the trolley tracks. And that tower I mean, is a massive edifice. That tower is in many, many pictures of North Street back in the old days. And um, it was a brownstone and brick building. And I guess I'd call it Richardsonian uh, Romanesque, similar to the Billings Library. And when Burlington went from one extreme to the other, because for years they had had terrible schools, terrible and they were crowded, they were shabby, and awful. And then they turned the page and they built these magnificent edifices. It was, you know, just one extreme to the other. Uh, unfortunately, the old schools weren't efficient in any way, shape, or form. They didn't have any gyms, they didn't have cafeterias, they didn't have, uh, um, they didn't have anything except classrooms, basically. They had 14 foot ceilings, they had huge central halls, so they just were really inefficient use of space. And um, so they became crowded and inadequate pretty quickly. So this building was torn down in 1956, uh, and it was replaced by the new Lawrence Barn School, which is much more efficient, but I'd rather look at this. Uh, you know, I mean, the old cliche, they don't build them like they used to. Very true. Next. 
Okay, this is a majestic theater. It wasn't exactly a movie palace from the outside, but it's important in Burlington's history because this was the first theater, movie theater that was built in Burlington as a, as a movie theater. It was built in 1912. Um, this is Bank Street in the foreground, and the street going down is Center Street. This is 1940. What happened to the um, Majestic, it was really prosperous for about the first 20 years of its life because it, it got to jump on everybody as far as being a movie theater and also sound. It was the first Burlington theater to show sound movies. And so um, it actually it was quite small when it started, only 600 seats, but then it expanded twice, got up to almost 1,000 seats, had almost no lobby. That's, they just squeezed as many seats in as they could. Next, the inside was, is, was surprisingly nice. I was shocked when I saw this picture because I had been told it was kind of blah, but I mean, it's got opera boxes, a little dome there, and you know, it's just, I think it's a very nice interior. But what happened was the Strong Theater, which had been built as a live performance venue, they really grudgingly started showing movies. They were the last theater in Burlington to have sound. <clears throat> and, um, but once they converted full-time to movies and the, and the Flynn opened in 1930, and the state opened in 1930, it was kind of curtains for the Majestic. They were reduced to being a B-movie house for the rest of their existence, pretty much. But as I said in the book, there's a market for B-movies too. And so, you know, 12 year old boys want to watch Gene Autry, you know, so, um, so they hung on until 1954. They showed their last movie in 1954. Next, and then they, you see the marquee there, it says, what does it say, for rent? What does it say? The angle, I can't read. Thank you. Yeah, it's hard for me to read it from this angle. Uh, no takers. So next, 1956, it was left, it was taken apart. And that's the majestic being demolished, sadly. All right, this is, I could, I could go an hour just on this. Um, but I won't, uh, because I only don't have time. This is the Frank R. Wells mansion. Frank R. Wells was... He was a uh, member of the Wells Richardson family. His father was William Wells, Civil War general whose statue was in Gettysburg and Battery Park. And Frank came along really when the time for huge estates and huge mansions and servants was passing into history. But Frank didn't seem to want to go along with that. So in 1915, he built, he had this home built this Georgian mansion on a 15 acre parcel uh, up on the hill located, uh, it was just on the other side of Cliff Street from the Colonel's estate. So this was bounded by Summit Street and Willard Street and Cliff Street. Mm -hmm. This house was set way back from the street on all three sides. And as the shrubbery and trees grew up, it became almost invisible. A lot of people didn't even know this place was there, um, even though it was huge. Next. So this is Frank R. Wells. His middle name was Richardson. And he worked for Wells Richardson, but the 1906 Pure Food and Drug Act really spelled the end for all the patent medicine vendors, of which Wells Richardson might have been the most successful in the United States. They had their, their headquarters was in Burlington, but they had an office in Montreal. They had an office in London, England, and Sydney, Australia. I mean, this place was, their, their, their complex is still there on College Street. And their printing office on Main Street, just down from the old bus terminal, probably was key to their success because they advertised like crazy. They Boatloads of mail came out of that place every day. Um, but Frank came along a little late to the party. He still had plenty of money, but it was ending. Next. This is another view of that same building. This is um, the side that would face the lake. Uh, it, it was high enough and there were no trees up that high. So we had a, a panoramic view of the lake. Um, oh, and then so what happened, you know, his wife died. They didn't have any children. Um, Frank got sick, he went in a nursing home and he died in 1957, I think. And so the, the, the house, was left in the will to UVM. Uh, unfortunately, there were some conditions that probably doomed it. Uh, 
I won't go into them all, but the main condition that, in my opinion, doomed it was he, uh, Frank told UVM that nothing could be changed, nothing. And so UVM declined the gift. And then it, it was just up for grabs. The Masons talked about buying it. Um, there was a hotel uh, group that was really interested in building a hotel there. They were going to tear it down. Um, and neither of those panned out. And so there was an auction. A, a doctor bought it, Dr. Leo Schildhaus. And he was a builder before he became a doctor. And he became a doctor because he couldn't build anymore because of uh, the depression and wartime restrictions, like I talked about before. So he went to medical school 10 years after he normally would have. So even though he was a doctor, he still was interested in development, and he bought this. Tore it down. They had, a, they had an auction of the contents that lasted a week. Then they leveled it, and the, the, the um, street summit ridge was put in. So there's 44 homes on this property now, nice homes, where two people used to live. So that was, you know, the end of the Gilded Age. Next. This was the gate. I believe this is Willard Street side. You can kind of see the mansion's chimneys way up the hill. But this was after it was overgrown and, you know, he had died. And, but you can see how yeah, no, no expense was spared even on those gates. Next. Okay, this is the Sparhawk Sanitarium. This was on the corner of Bank Street and St. Paul Street. And this was built as a sanitarium, not as a, as a residence. The main building is to the right. The building on the left was actually a small carriage house initially, but they tore that down or they expanded it to this. And then next, they expanded it to this, the bathhouse, because this sanitarium specialized in baths. Sulfur baths, Russian baths, Turkish baths, electro baths, you know, you name it, they had it. Um, and so it was very successful. People, they also would, would deliver babies and do surgery. And this was the only, back in those days, back in, when, when Mary Fletcher first opened, they did not allow maternity cases. They were not seen as needing the hospital. So if you wanted to, have, most people had their kids at home, just the way it had always been. So if you wanted to have your baby delivered, in a, you know, somewhat controlled setting by a doctor, this was an option. And, you know, some people took it, not many, but some did. So uh, the sanitarium closed because there were two Dr. Sparhawks. The second one died fairly young. And so that was the end of the sanitarium in the Sparhawk name. And they sold these buildings to the Oddfellows, uh, which was a very, very popular fraternal organization back in the day. They were there for, I don't know, 20 years or so. And then what happened was the Vermont Federal Savings Bank, which was had a small office on Main Street, everybody was buying cars and houses and everything else. So the banks were booming. So they wanted to really expand and they, they bought the parcel that the Sparhawk Sanitarium sat on. They, they demolished it and they built the, that bank that's still there now, the uh, green and silver <laughs> glass, uh, uh, bank building. I'm not even, I can't keep track of what bank is wearing anymore. Um, so that's, that was the Sparhawk, um, torn down in 1958, replaced by, by the uh, Burlington Federal Savings and Loan. The 1959 Cathedral Grammar School, which dominated Burlington, um, it had the tallest spire ever downtown, 125 feet. And it was just a massive building. I mean, you know, just solid as a, a rocket Gibraltar, really. Um, brick and nice details on the front. And, but, the, but the main point that you saw was that tower. Next. This is St. Paul Street, by the way. This is the, looking from the south, still St. Paul Street, but color. Um, you can see the copper roof. And that's the bank I was just talking about, the Burlington Federal Savings and Loan. So what happened was the Burlington Federal Savings and Loan opened up and guess what? They needed parking. Uh, yep. So they said, and, well, there, there was other stuff going on too. The, the Catholic schools and the public schools were just booming with kids. The baby boom was, was in full swing. And so uh, Cathedral High School, which we'll get to in a bit, was overcrowded. They, their freshmen went to Pomeroy. Whoops. Um, because there wasn't room at the high school. 
So Rice High School was built, and that land that was, uh, where it was built was actually bought by Cathedral Parish as a cemetery. But priorities changed, and so they needed a new high school, so they built Rice Memorial High School. The kids from Cathedral moved to Rice High School, along with the freshmen that were at Pomeroy, and the students that were attending this school went to the old Cathedral High School building. So this building became empty. Sold to Burlington Federal Savings and Loan, next, who set about demolishing it. Um, now, oops, that, that's okay. So that spire had a cross on top, which one of the parishes had been promised because you know the, the, the building dated to 1901 and the cross was quite ornate, but it was just too unsafe to get it down in one piece. So they ended up pulling the whole spire down and it all came crashing to the ground next. And there's the cross. And you can see how big the cross is, and you can imagine how tall that spire was. Um, I, don't, I don't think anything was done with it. It was probably just thrown away because it was too wrecked. Next. And there's the parking lot. There you go. Uh, okay, next. This is the original Pomeroy School. 1872, 73, somewhere around there. And again, quickly became full, overcrowded. Next. So in 1898, it was expanded. And this is how it looked after they basically doubled the size of the school. But when Rice opened and the kids, the freshmen, uh, the cathedral freshmen moved out of Pomeroy, Burlington had stopped using it several years before. So this building was empty. It was old, very old, and so it was demolished. Next. Probably solid, but you know, nobody asked me. Okay, this is the home for destitute children. This was um, way back in the days around the Civil War and before, Burlington did not have any public charities except for the poor farm. And nobody really wanted to go there. And most of the people went, that went to the poor, poor farm weren't from Burlington, a whole other story. So there were a lot of people who were struggling to survive in those days. And they were having kids that they couldn't support. And so some of the women in Burlington, Lucia Wheeler was the main driver. They were taking kids to their homes and it just got to be too much. They didn't have room and they couldn't handle them and whatever. And so uh, there was a marine hospital that had been built by the government. Uh, this is about where Market 32 is right now. So that marine hospital, um, it served as a Civil War hospital during the Civil War. But after the Civil War ended, the marine hospital was basically abandoned by the government because it hadn't really been used much before the war. And so Lucia Wheeler bought it with her um, comrades. And uh, the businessmen in Burlington, who normally would have swooped on that land, did not bid on it, letting her get it for a, a real bargain. And so they built, um, the, first they used just that Marine Hospital, which housed about 40 kids. And it started, this started actually as a home for destitute girls, but it became obvious pretty quickly that there was an equal opportunity need. So they opened it up to boys too. So then they expanded. Um, they put a big addition on the Marine Hospital and uh, they, they could accommodate 100 kids, but that building burned in 1893, and they built a campus. These were the two main buildings. There were a lot of other smaller buildings, and um, this was on that corner until 1960. Home Avenue is named for the home. It was called the Children's Home uh, in later years, but that's where Home Avenue got its name. So this was torn down for a shopping center. Next. Yeah, unfortunately, this is kind of like the same picture, only with bigger trees and a little better clarity. So we'll skip right over that. And this is what took its place. Um, this was the Shelburne Road Shopping Plaza. The anchor store was Grants. Sears would soon move in here. This was 1960 and 61 maybe. Sears moved in in 1964 and became the dominant store in that uh, complex. Next. All right, this is, if you want a case study in historic preservation, uh, what not to do, this, this is it. Um, so I should mention around 1960, 1961, 
New York City demolished Pennsylvania Station, which was a magnificent block, huge, it took up a whole city block. It was like a Roman temple. As a matter of fact, it was modeled after Roman baths. And it was announced that it was gonna be torn down, but nobody really paid attention except for a small group of activists. Then when they actually started tearing it down, everybody said, what? What's, what, what's going on? But then it was too late. So that was kind of the birth of the historic preservation movement nationally. But like most trends, things get to Vermont much more slowly. So this is 1964. This is the Howard Relief Building. Uh, the Unitarian Church is just to the left. That's Clark Street. This was built in 1884, funded by Louisa Howard of the Mortuary Chapel fame. She was really charity-minded. She never married. She was very interested in, in helping the poor. And so she built this home. Um, it had numerous names over the years, but the Howard Center, the Howard name, is still, still with us. And it started here, the Howard Relief Society, the Howard Missions, you know, it's, it's got several names. But anyway, so this lasted for quite some time, but then by the early 60s, what happened was Abernathy's department store, which was right across the street in the Richardson building, they were starting to feel the pinch from sh shopping centers. They had tons of free parking and you know they, they just had all the advantages that the downtown stores did not have. Abernathy's was an institution. It was a beautiful, beautiful store, a beautiful building, but they were, they were hurting, no parking. So uh, no free parking anyway, and, and very little that wasn't free. So the Howard Center put this building up for sale. Next. There it is for sale. The price. This is 1964, $35,000. Abernathy bought it, totally with the intention of tearing it down for a parking lot. And again, I read the blurb in the paper announcing the sale. No outrage, no like, what are they doing? Nothing, just Abernathy is buying it for a parking lot and they will tear it down and that was it. So that's what happened. He bought it, tore it down, and next, this is it being torn down. Um, this is why it's a great case study because you actually have, you know, <laughs> before and then for sale and there's multiple pictures of it being torn down. And then finally, next, there's your parking lot, still there. So the parking lots tend to stay. You notice that? Uh, yeah. So, and Abbott Athens is long gone. I think they closed in 83, maybe. Um, so maybe it bought them a little time, but it didn't save them. Next. Uh, next is F.W. Woolworth, one of the most beloved stores <laughs> among my generation and, and earlier ones, even though it was a chain store. Um, people love the dime stores. They still talk about them. The, the interesting thing about uh, Woolworths, which started on Church Street in 1899, the building to the left with the two large semicircular windows, that was the barrels block. And Woolworths was slowly expanding um, into that block. They were about to take over the last space there, you can see ghost signage for the fashion shop, which became Magrams. That was there initially. So anyway, Magrams moved into that, but the Barrels block has an interesting quick history I'll give you next. Augustus Barrels and his wife, they bought, they built this block and they had a three-year-old daughter named Kathleen. They had, a, they had a daughter named Kathleen who died when she was three. And so they built this tower on top as a memorial to her. And there was actually a plaque on the building, which you can't read, but it, it, there was a plaque to her. Um, and that tower is, on, is in so many pictures of downtown Burlington over the years. But then, of course, when they came in to tear down the barrels block, the tower went as well. So down came Woolworths uh, old building. And next, this was a new one, uh, put up the same year, 1964. Next, this is the 1871 Burlington High School. Again, there's doors on either side for the boys and the girls, even at high school, um, and a front door. And you can see it was a beautiful building, an uh, inside roof and a beautiful uh, tower. Um, but then in 1900, again, everything was growing so fast they couldn't keep up. But in 1900, they built Edmonds High School and this became excess property, but they used it for decades and decades. It was finally torn down next in 1965. It had just worn out. Uh, the Benson roof was gone. 
the tower was gone. It didn't really look anything like the picture I just showed you, uh, but this is it being torn down. Next, 1965. Okay, next is urban renewal, which is you know kind of a hornet's nest, rightly so. If giving away South Burlington was dumb mistake number one, this was dumb mistake number two. Um, but this was a national program and free money, it's irresistible. And that's what, what was happening was the federal government was waiving money for redevelopment at, at all these cities and towns, and but they had to declare that their, their, these neighborhoods were blighted slums, and they, had, they actually took a vote on it. Yes, they're slums, and, and it passed. So they got the money, and then they said about the whole process of, I think I better use this. But, uh, let's see if we can, yeah, okay. So uh, this is St. Paul's Cathedral. That was not initially in the, in the uh, urban renewal zone. This part was. And all this back here, all the, both sides of Battery Street and then College Street, uh, that, that, this was all taken down. And when St. Paul's burned, that became part of the urban renewal zone too. Next. I forgot I had the pointer. <laughs> so this is it after most of it's been torn down. I believe this here. This is, I believe this is the last remaining house. It was a, they called it the Dutra Ponderosa. Uh, they held out longer than anybody, but everybody finally had to give in. They just the, the government was forcing them out at low prices, I might add. <clears throat> so um, there, there were some blighted areas, uh, mainly around Battery Street. Next. This was one blighted building. This was the Lakeview House. It was a rooming house that was built in the 1890s. And you can see it was pretty decrepit. It was a slum. Uh, that's kind of what they were showing the federal government people, uh, you know, like, oh, we got to get rid of this stuff. It's terrible. Um, but there were so many solid, good buildings and, and historic buildings and beautiful buildings that were, were torn down as well, which we'll show you a few of them here. Next. This is the cover of the book, Converse School. Um, my opinion, I don't think there's too much discussion about this, the most magnificent school ever built in Burlington. And um, this, this was on the corner of Pine and Sherry, built in 1893. Architect and builder were both from Ohio. And, um, but again, it was inefficient. High ceilings, not that many classrooms. I think this sat 400, they had 400 kids. Uh, that was the capacity, but they were over that quickly. Um, so this was in the wrong place, wrong time. Next. Uh, here it is. You can see the tower is gone because what happened was on all these schools, Lawrence Barnes, which I showed you before, all the schools that had bell towers, the bell towers came down before the school came down because the, the elements got in. They were open to the weather so that people could hear the bell. And so the birds got in and the snow got in and the rain got in and caused deterioration so that the the towers were all taken down. So this is right before demolition. Um, that's that house, that house right there. Um, no, ne never mind. Um, so anyway, still a, a magnificent building, but um, you know that the city fathers were telling us it was uh, it had deteriorated and blah blah blah. And you know, okay, well, whose fault was that? Next. <laughs> uh, I hate to say it, but I you know very similar. Saga to a memorial auditorium. Um, this was a mansion. Uh, it was called the Matthews Mansion. This fellow made a fortune in uh, windows and doors, one of the many lumber industries on the Burlington waterfront. This is right across the street from Converse School. You can see it there to the right. Uh, other corner of Pine and Cherry, fronted on Cherry Street. When, when Urban Renewal came calling, this was the Reedy Funeral Home. Next. And if you don't believe me, there's the sign. Um, they moved to Shelburne Road, where they still are. Next. This was on Pearl Street, near Battery Park. It was a small home, but it was a very historic home. This was the home of Charles Heidi, the artist. He was married to Walt Whitman's sister, and he did a lot of beautiful paintings of Vermont and other places, but mainly Vermont. Um, he had a lot of issues, we're not gonna get into that now, no time, but um, I also heard, again, I haven't been able to verify this, that officers stayed here during the War of 1812. So this, anyway, 
any way you slice it, this was a very historic building, and um, it was level. Next. Doesn't look like much, but this was the oldest building in Burlington when urban renewal happened. This was 1808. Um, red brick building, again, separate doors on the left and right for the boys and the girls. This was near the, the lake end of Cherry Street. It was called Cherry Street School, and it was torn down. Uh, it hadn't been a school for years, but, you know. Next. This was the Philo Doolittle home. There's Copper School again. Uh, this was the corner of Bank and Pine. And that's actually, Philo Doolittle was a very important person in the history of Burlington's business, and he was a banker also. He built this home. This actually was renovated and looked quite different when it was torn down, but I couldn't, I didn't want to put two pictures of it. And that is actually Philo Doolittle's son, and you can see he's a very old man. This house probably went back at least to the 1850s. Uh, you know, I didn't spend a lot of time trying to drill down. The further back you get, it, the harder it is to pinpoint a, a date. Next. This was a nice Victorian that was on Lower College Street. At the time this picture was taken, it was the, uh, the Randall Inn. Uh, this is also the Sarah Holbrook Center for many years. And um, this was built as a residence, uh, Spalding of Spalding and Kimball, Mr. Spalding. This was his home. He was a very wealthy grocery wholesaler. And he built a beautiful home to, you know, show his status in the city. Uh, but again, just pushed over when Urban Renewal came calling because they didn't really care. What, you know, if you were in the, in the zone, you were gone. So that was it. Next. I thought I'd throw some bit, bit, oh, I keep doing this, businesses in. In addition to the homes, there were quite a few businesses in the urban renewal zone. This is Corey's Market, it was on South Champlain Street, and I love that night photo. It was by James Dettori. It, it's, it's art, I'm sorry, look at that. Uh, this was attached to their home, which was a large, brick, solid, well-kept home. Bulldoze, next. And Marola's Market, uh, 35 Cherry Street, corner of South Champlain and Cherry. It was a neighborhood institution, um, specialized in Italian groceries, had been there for decades. And uh, the Marolas ended up moving to other parts of the city and opening stores. But, you know, again, neighborhood institution that everybody missed the day it was leveled and continues to miss to this day. Next. Bernardini's Cafe, this was on the corner of Pearl and South Champlain. And um, it was kind of similar to Bo, it's only quite a bit bigger. Everybody said, I never ate there, but everybody said the food was as good or better than Bo's. Um, but again, uh, it was in the wrong place. This is actually bare land now because this was part of the land swap between um, St. Paul's Parish and the urban renewal developers. I'll, I'll get into in a second. Uh, anyway, it got torn down too. next. Mother Mokwin's Bakery, uh, if you're old enough, you will remember Mother Mokwin's Bread in the stores. Uh, this was on Ch South Champlain Street, one of two bakeries that were in the urban renewal zone. The other one was Gerard's, which was on Cherry Street. They didn't tear down all of Gerard's building, but the, the bakery ceased operation. So two bakeries were lost in addition to everything else. Next. And this is what you got. That's what got. Instead of what was there. The Cherry Street parking garage, <laughs> not even there anymore. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, what, what, what can you say? I mean, when you take a neighborhood filled with character and history and you replace it with a metal box, I'm sorry, doesn't wash. Next. This is an aerial view, kind of looking at the urban renewal zone from the lakeside. Uh, there's the parking garage we just looked at, Radisson. Um, I think that's a chicken bank. And, um, you know, basically they're all just they're varieties of, rec of cubes and boxes. So, and you can see outside on the, on the rim here, the periphery, you've got the old buildings, Masonic Temple and the Congo Church and so on. You know, a city is kind of defined by its buildings, its public buildings, especially and its skyline, if you're a big city, but Burlington is not a big city. And these buildings really defined it. Um, and every time you replace one of them with a box, it, it, one more step toward being becoming every anywhere USA, in my opinion. Next. 
This is the so-called home for friendless women. This was a mansion that was on um, Shelburne Road. It was uh, occupied by a man named Weed, Judge Weed. And um, again, it was a case where a lot of women got in trouble, not just getting pregnant, but their husbands would abandon them. The, the first several pe people that came to the Home for Friendless Women were not pregnant. They had been abandoned. So it, it was a need, a need that was there. Next. This is just another view of it. And um, eventually it became the Elizabeth Lund home, named after Mrs. Lund, whose husband, Dr. William Lund, contributed the money to build, um, to, to save the Lund home, basically, because it was really struggling financially. So he, he left, I think, his whole fortune to them and on the proviso that it be named after his wife. And so that's what happened. This, this uh, was there f until 1970 when a new Lund home was built and this was demolished and Hickok and Boardman built a building there. Next. Okay, next is uh, Oak Ledge. This was uh, built as a residence, very grand home for Dr. William Seward Webb and his wife, who was a Vanderbilt. So there was unlimited money and it was being built as a farm complex, not just a home. They had all kinds of outbuildings and barns and livestock and so on and so on. Next. But the, the, web, uh, the webs were only there for a few years and they moved to Shelburne Farms, which they built, which is obviously way, way more grandiose than this. So this became available and it became um, a, a public resort called Oak Ledge Manor open to the public for meals, uh, events, overnight stays and so forth. Uh, had a long successful run. Then it was bought by the GEAA, the General Electric Athletic Association, I think that stands for, uh, which was um, General Electric was a huge employer. Um, I think they were the biggest employer in Burlington at the time. And they had this huge athletic group or activity group. They bought uh, this and renamed it Cliffside, Cliffside Country Club. And, that was in business for about 12 years. Then the city wanted it, and so they wrangled about the price, and finally the city was able to buy it at a price they could live with, and next, they put the torch to it. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, you know, it burned, but it was intentionally burned. That's, that's why that's included here. So, you know, it had been neglected, but again, if you take care of things, the problem with a lot of historic buildings is they're very expensive to keep up, very ex especially the stone ones. Next. This is the St. Paul's Rectory. That's the corner of Bank and Pine. You can see the cathedral. That's the, actually the chapel to the right. So this is after the fire. The rectory was untouched. The rest of the, the, rest of the uh, church was gutted. And so, as I said, this once the church burned, things changed. The developers of the urban renewal zone knew that they couldn't buy St. Patrick's St. St. Paul's Cathedral, but then when it burned, it became available. So they they worked a deal where they would swap the parcel, the parish would, would swap the parcel that uh, the church and the rectory was on for a huge parcel on the corner of Pearl and. Um, battery. And that's where Bernardini's was. That's how far, that's how far that parcel extended. So the swap was made. St. Paul's built their new cathedral up on that corner and the developers leveled the rectory. That was built in 1885. It was another gift from John Purple Howard, one of Burlington's biggest benefactors, Howard Opera House and many, many other gifts. Next. That's the corner now. No. Next. This is uh, Ira Allen School, it's on Colchester Avenue. Um, very similar to the Thayer School on North Avenue, except one story. Same builder, these were actually built at the same time, Thayer and this. Um, same outfit from Ohio built them. This again, it was inefficient, uh, tower was gone, <laughs> you know, kind of the same old story. And this was torn down in, I'd have to look at my notes, but uh, it was torn down. <laughs> Next. Too many dates, Devin. This is Lakeview uh, Sanitarium, another sanitarium. Burlington was very popular for sanitariums because 
it was used, viewed as a very bucolic, restful place with the lake and a lot of wide open land and so forth. But most of the sanitariums were right, were right downtown or near it. This one was out on North Avenue, well out. And um, this was built, it was going to be a home, but the person, S.E. Howard, died. And um, a doctor bought it and, and built this as a sanitarium. And it was advertised for its wide open spaces, its cottages, its animals. They had lambs and stuff like that. Next. And the building next, which I think you just showed as having an award, um, this was one of the outbuildings, Redstone Cottage for the Lakeview Sanitarium. You see it on the left there, Dr. Barry, Walter D. Barry. So that is still there, obviously. Um, Lakeview Sanitarium was torn, the, the main building. After it stopped being a sanitarium, it was a Don Bosco school for boys run by the Catholic Church. And then when that closed, uh, I think it was a drug treatment center for a while. And then it was torn down. So that's gone. They're all gone. <laughs> and this is the Sutton County Jail, we built in the 1890s. This is 1906, and at that time, the cell unit to the right was octagonal, and they actually had a rotating cage where they would rotate the, so that the guards didn't have to interact as much, uh, less, less danger of being attacked by a guard, I guess. I'm, I'm not sure the, how the whole thing worked, but, um, but then later on, Next, next picture, that was replaced by just a basic, uh, you know, rectangular unit on the back. And this is right before it was torn down. Uh, you can see it's looking pretty shabby. And uh, down it came, replaced by the Chittenden County Correctional Center. Don't call them jails anymore. Next. All right. This is one of the worst uh, <laughs> travesties, I guess you call it. Cathedral High School. This opened in 1917. Um, Again, the population of students was exploding and many kids uh, didn't have a chance to go to high school. They went right to work. And one of the main reasons was there, there wasn't enough room in the high school at Burlington, at Edmonds. So the Catholic diocese, which had huge uh, grammar schools, they were the biggest schools in the city, as Nazareth and Cathedral Grammar, they built this to accommodate the kids that were being educated in the Catholic grammar schools. So this was a corner of Pearl and St. Paul. And it's a classic of what's called cathedral, uh, cathedral Gothic. Um, it had all kinds of ornaments, stone ornaments and pinnaces on the top and stone crosses and carvings and uh, the cornerstone. It was just a beautiful, beautiful building. Solid, solid. Um, so like I said, the Kids from Cathedral Grammar started going here after Rice opened, um, but then eventually it they closed Cathedral Grammar, so they just didn't have Cathedral Grammar anymore, and so this was eventually torn down in 1976. Next, we gotta begin to the end here. This is the Bishop's House, 52 South William Street. This was again built as a residence uh, in the 1850s. It was expanded at least once. Uh, last private owner was A.E. Richardson, who built the Richardson, um, where Abernathy's was, and who also was one of the founders of Wells and Richardson. So a lot of money, and he built this huge home and, on a huge lot. And you can see where it was. Uh, the buildings of the university are just in, in the background there. So uh, what happened was the Catholic bishop came in, Bishop Marshall, and this was the bishop's residence, and the bishop, both the Catholic and the Episcopal, Episcopal bishops had lived in grand homes for decades. And the new bishop said, no, I, I wanna, I'm just gonna move to an apartment, let's just sell this. There was a lot of outcry because people didn't want to be sold because the inside was spectacular. Um, so once it got out that they were gonna sell this and the buyer was gonna be in the hospital, and guess what they were gonna do with it? Another parking lot. So uh, there was a finally historic preservation got off the mat, so to speak, and started putting up a, a ruckus. And there were all kinds of volunteers and lawyers doing pro bono filings and so on and so on and so on. Um, but they only succeeded in delaying uh, the inevitable after about two years. Uh, this was torn down in 1979, I believe. And there's a couple of shots of some of the inside woodwork next. You can see that's one room, the dining room. Uh, I 
mean, just wall to wall and ceiling and everything. Woodwork, beautiful. Next, this is black and white, but you get the idea. The staircase, uh, the whole house was full of stuff like this. 11 fireplaces, you know, just irreplaceable. The inside was saved, uh, and it was put into a building uh, where the the mill restaurant used to be in Okluski. Next, and there's the parking lot. Next, <coughs> St. Anthony's School opened in 1920. Um, yeah, over time, as the baby boom crested, uh, the attendance started to drop. Christ the Kings had opened a school, and so they just closed because of lack of enrollment, and they I believe this was demolished in 1982. Next. And this is the 1871 Chittenden County Courthouse. This is Lower Church Street. Uh, the street up would be Main Street. And to the left is the old um, custom house and post office. That's long gone, too. Uh, replaced by a magnificent building, which is that marble building with the huge columns on the corner. This building uh, was still in good shape, but the side judges wanted a new courthouse and it became a real fiasco. They were talking about tearing down some unbelievably valuable historic properties, you know, to build a new courthouse on, on a location. And so anyway, uh, there was a battle as long as this, how, as this courthouse was, was standing and, and sound. It was again neglected, but it was still solid. But then there was a fire, uh, there was a lot of damage, but then it became a, a, a political football between the side judges and the city. Should it be torn down or is it, can it be repaired? The judges said, no, no, it's gotta go, it's unsafe. The city, um, the, the, they don't call the city engineer, but whatever his title was, he said, his expert said it could be repaired and uh, you know, then all of a sudden the side judges called it a wrecker and they started tearing it down without the city's permission. It was a real nightmare. But anyway, it did get torn down. So um, I think that's the last one. Nope, one more. Okay, this is a Walker Lodge, uh, a very small hotel, but very nice. Uh, this was across from the Sherwood Hotel on Main Street, if you know where that was. If you don't know where that was, this was right down from the bus terminal on Main Street, on the same side. And it was built as a long-term stay hotel. The owners lived there. So it was really popular with people because it was it was quiet and uh, it was well kept up. And um, it was just a nice, small place to spend your years. And so that eventually over time, that changed and it kind of became seedy. It fell into disrepair. Uh, I think it became a homeless shelter at one point. Um, but anyway, it was it was finally demolished. So So that's... That's no longer around either. So, so um, that's the end of the that's the end of the pictures. So. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's great. So I realize we're we're over time, um, but that was fantastic. <laughs> that was fascinating. Uh, anybody wants one of these? Get it. And if anyone has questions, uh, Bob, you want to? If there are any questions from the audience, we can certainly. Uh, but yes. You recounted a lot of. I'm I'm super depressed. <laughs> but have, have you cataloged how many buildings you found that have disappeared? Well, I mean, these are the major ones. There's many more, obviously, but right. these are the major ones. There's 64 what I call landmarks in the book. They're not all buildings. But it doesn't cover. It didn't cover everything, you know. Yeah. So. Sixty-four by itself is a lot. Yeah. Yeah. More than that. Yeah. That really gets a lot well, especially when you consider how visible they were. I mean, just the two cathedrals are crying out loud. I mean, I know people have still not here gotten over those those fires, you know. So. And the strong theater, and you know, just yeah, it was bad. Again, I didn't talk about the fires, but <laughs> yeah, so much was lost to fire. It was awful. So. I'm not aware of that, but there is a whole book on that 
on that controversy. Um, I don't remember that. I don't remember the name of it. There is a book about that, so I'm sure that would get into that detail. Yeah. Anything else? Nope. Okay. Great. All right. Thank you very much. And thank you everyone very much for coming this evening. Appreciate your interest and congratulations to our award winners. Thanks a lot. Have a great night.